Paul writes the letter of Philippians to a church that partnered with him in the gospel, is experiencing some persecution, and has some kind of internal conflict or, or disunity. Now, what does a church like that need to hear? Paul concludes that the Philippians need to know that they are in Messiah. And yes, they are justified in the Messiah, but that's not Paul's main concern. He wants the Philippians to see their lives as a lived expression of the life of the Messiah. And that life of the Messiah is told preeminently in Philippians 2, 6 to 11, but every other part of the letter is then going to show us how our lives can be a participation in the life of the Messiah, specifically his humiliation and his exaltation. And we're going to be jumping around a little bit in this lecture, but let's get started in Paul's opening thanksgiving and prayer, where he, he thanks God for the Philippians koinonia in the gospel. And this word koinonia is super important in Philippians, and we need to talk about it for a minute. We often think of the word koinonia kind of like, like fellowship, but the word is so much stronger than, than mere friendship or community. It, it carries this idea of, of mutual partnership in some external source. Like, like you and I have koinonia in the gospel together, and you and I have koinonia in the spirit. And there's also an element in this word, an element of participation. So Paul has koinonia. Um, he, he participates in the gospel by going around and preaching the gospel and starting Jesus communities. But the Philippians, they have koinonia. They participate in the gospel by supporting Paul's ministry, by, by giving um, to him for the work of the gospel. But Paul wants to make sure, make clear that the Philippians are not merely, they do not merely have koinonia in the gospel through their money, but they are participating or they are partaking with Paul in his suffering. Let me show you how Paul makes that point at the both beginning and ending of his letter. So here in purple is this word koinonia, partnership, partaking fellowship, share. It says they have partnership in the gospel, but they also partake with Paul um, in his imprisonment. Um, this is the same word, koinonia, um, in Paul's imprisonment. And then if we go down to chapter four, it says that they, sure, they enter into partnership or koinonia with Paul in giving, but they also have koinonia um, in, his, in his trouble. This is Paul's suffering. So this is how Paul is going to link the Philippian story with Jesus's story. So Jesus suffered for the sake of the church. So the Philippians are partaking in Jesus's suffering for the sake of the church. And they're doing so through um, their self-sacrificial giving. Um, it says in 2 Corinthians 8 that the, the church in Macedonia has to be talking about the Philippians. It says that their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity. I mean, they were extremely poor, it says, and yes, yet they gave to the work of the ministry. So um, the Philippians, they certainly are sharing in the sufferings of the Messiah. They will also share in his exaltation. Now, Jesus, he was exalted in his resurrection and in his ascension. Um, the Philippians, they will be exalted on the day of the Lord. It's that Old Testament phrase, the day of the Lord, the day of the Messiah, when Jesus will, will come back, his second coming, and that's when they will have their resurrection bodies. Now, here in 1, 3 to 11, Paul is going to give a double reference to that day of the Lord. Let's see how he does that. Back up to chapter one, let's look at the two times that Paul references the day of the Lord when the Philippians will be exalted. It says that on the day of Messiah, um, the good work that God began in them, it will be completed. They will be completed, exalted on the day of the Lord. And also on the day of the Lord, they will be pure and blameless. 
So our next section, again, we go from Philippians now to Paul and look at his suffering in 112 to 26. Now, the Philippians, they were worried about Paul, worried about him um, in prison. And Paul wants the Philippians to see his imprisonment the way that Paul sees his imprisonment. And yes, um, Paul makes it clear to them that God turned this evil into good. Whole imperial guard heard the gospel as a result of him being in prison. But he also gives another benefit of, of Paul suffering for the gospel. And that benefit is that other brothers, um, other believers are hearing about Paul's suffering and they want to suffer for the sake of the gospel, just like Paul um, is suffering. Let me, let me show you that. It's this idea of, of example, following a good and worthy example. And that's so important in Philippians. See this? Um, that this imprisonment, it actually is turning out for the advance of the gospel. Whole imperial guard heard, and most of the brothers have been confident in Messiah because of my imprisonment, and now are bold to speak without fear, just as I am. Um, <clears throat> and this idea of, of impersonation, of well, not impersonation, of, of imitation, uh, it's going to be repeated uh, several times in Philippians. Let's jump over to chapter 3 and 17. He says, brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. And now I think th I think that's the same the same thing. Uh, following a worthy example is what's referred to in these famous words. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, like this is a worthy example that you have. Think about these things, those good examples that are before you, and what you have learned and heard and received from me. Practice these things. Follow. Um, the good examples set before you. Now, if there's anyone who is true, just, honorable, lovely, commendable, it would be these guys. We're jumping now over to 219 to 30, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Um, Paul is going to present them as good examples that the Philippians should follow because Timothy and Epaphroditus are following the example of Messiah. So, you know what's great about Timothy? Paul says, Man, everyone else, all they care about is their own interests, but not Timothy. He cares about the interests of others like Christ does. Let me show you how Paul links the story of Timothy to the story of Jesus in, in chapter 2. Scroll up to chapter 2, jumping back and forth. See, Timothy, um, he, he does not seek his own interests. Just like it says here, Jesus didn't seek his own interests. Rather, he became a servant and he sought the interests of others. What about Epaphroditus? He's the same way. Man, he nearly died for the work of the ministry. And in so doing, he is living out the, the story of Jesus' radical self-sacrifice for the sake of the church. But now um, let's jump back to Paul's example of imitating the sufferings of Christ. <clears throat> so Paul says, you know, I'm in prison, but I'm pretty sure I I'm going to be released. But he says, I, I, I might not be. I, I might not be released from prison. I, I might be executed. I, I might die. And you know what he says? That's fine. Either alternative is okay with me. If I live, that means I can continue serving the church like Jesus did with his life. But if I die, well, that means that I depart and be with Christ, and that's far better. Now, the only reason that he could say something like that is because he has fully internalized the reality that he is in Messiah. And that's how he can say, for me, to live is Messiah. Um. To live is to be in the continual imitation of the life of the Messiah. Think about Galatians 2.20, um, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. For me to live is Messiah, and to die is, is gain. It's, that's when I will be exalted with the Messiah. To die is gain. So let's go from... Philippians, Paul, back to the Philippians. 
And here, Paul is going to frame their experiences after the pattern of the Messiah. So um, there's a little bit of disunity in Philippi. We already saw that. And Paul is going to offer the antidote to that disunity. And, you know, Yodia Syneke, uh, you probably want to listen up here. That antidote is the humility of Christ. Um, and let's take a look at a couple of key words here in this section. Um, the humility of Christ that the Philippians are to e exemplify. So look at this word, participation. If there is any participation in the Spirit, that word, as you probably guessed, is koinonia. If you, the Philippians, um, are partakers, are participants together in the Spirit, will then have the same mind as Jesus. He was humble, you be humble. Um, and together, have the same mind, have the same love, have the same spirit, strive side to side together, be united. See all these things highlighted in brown, it's emphasis on, on unity. Um, and that unity is, is possible um, only because they are together in Messiah. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Messiah. Um, and then look as well how Paul frames the Philippians' suffering. Um, he says that for you it is granted not only to believe in Jesus, but also to suffer for his sake. It, it, for Paul, he says, man, this suffering you're experiencing, this is a privilege. This is a gift because there is no better way for you to know your Messiah than to know him through his sufferings. And he says that the correct response for you then in your suffering is joy. And that's the example that, that Paul sets. Um, in his suffering, he was joyful. Let's look at that quickly in, in 2.17. 2.17. He says, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering, even, even if I do die, man, I am glad. I rejoice. And you know what? You too, you should follow my example and be glad and rejoice with me. And you probably... Um, you probably know and have heard that Philippians is called the epistle of joy. And I've kind of scattered that word joy throughout um, this letter. And, and you'll see it when, when you look up this word joy in Philippians, how often it is linked to or attached to or in the, the, the um, proximity of um, suffering. And the only thing that enables one to be joyful in their suffering is um, <clears throat> if they realize that they are united with Christ. And that enables one to, to stand firm in suffering, to not be afraid, and also to not grumble. And I think that's probably what's going on in these famous lines as well, where it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition, present your request to God. That is... Um, fearlessness, joyful fearlessness in the face of suffering, knowing that you are united with Christ in his own suffering and will also be exalted. Um, <clears throat> so in this life, let's return to the Philippians here. In this life, the Philippians will experience suffering as Jesus did. On the day of the Lord, they will be exalted. They will be vindicated. And there's an important line here in uh, 127 and 28 where it says their enemies will be destroyed on the day of the Lord, but they will be saved. Um, and it, there's an important link to a, a verse in Ephesians, which I think is powerful and I, I want to spell out for you. So let's go to 127. Um, let's see. So... <laughs> As you are united um, in Messiah together and have one spirit and are standing firm and not frightened by your opponents, um, this is a clear sign to them, to your opponents, that they will be destroyed on the day of the Lord, but you will be saved. And this, I, I said it, there's a, a fun connection to Ephesians. Let's look at Ephesians 3, 
10. And it's a clear sign to them of their destruction. So um, in Ephesians, uh, the church, let's see, the church, which is the, the, the unification of Jew and Gentile together, the church uh, displays the wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities, um, demonstrating to them that, man, they have lost because um, we are united together to the Messiah. Um, let's see, our next step, let's return. We've just considered Paul's example. Let's jump now to 3, 1 to 4 and return to um, Paul's example. Having done Philippians, let's return to Paul. So like the, the Judaizers, this is, um, <clears throat> remember, uh, this section started out, we discussed this in our situational context lecture with Paul warning the Philippians about the Judaizers. And notice how Paul will use this situation as an opportunity to teach about our union with Christ. So like the Judaizers, Paul at one point before Christ met him on the road to Damascus, Paul had confidence in the flesh. He had confidence in his own works. Um, he calls this a righteousness that comes from the law. Um, and he, he will go so far as to say, man, Judaizers, you think you guys have confidence in the law? You got nothing on me. Let, let's see that in 3 verse 4. Paul will say, <laughs> uh, we're in Ephesians. We need to be in Philippians. Um, though I myself have reason uh, for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks they have confidence in the flesh, Judaizers, man, you got nothing. I have more, Paul says. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, man, I'm a Pharisee. As to zeal, persecutor of the church, Paul speaking of his future life. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless, Paul says. And all of that, all of his confidence in the flesh, his, his former gain, that, is his, his, that was his glory. Um, he was, man, he was a rising star in Judaism, wasn't he? Um, he was a shoo-in for being the next Nicodemus or the next Gamaliel. But Paul gave it all up. He, he emptied himself of that glory. Um, he, he counted it all as lost. It, it says here in this humility section that he suffered the loss of all things, considered it all as rubbish in order that he may gain Christ, that he may be found in Christ, that he may know Messiah. And there's this critical line in um, Ephesians or in Philippians 3:10, where it says that he might um, have koinonia with Jesus's sufferings, that he may participate and share in the sufferings of Christ. It is an extremely powerful verse. Let's look at it. Paul gave up all of his glory. He emptied himself of his glory. Um, saying, man, my righteousness doesn't come from my own works or from the law. It comes from faith in Christ. And then he like interrupts himself and he says, oh, that I would know him, know the power of his resurrection and share, have koinonia, share in Christ's sufferings and become like him in his death. For I know that in sharing with Christ's sufferings, I will share with his exaltation and attain the resurrection from the dead. And do you see how Paul is he sees his his whole life as just a a reenactment of the life of Messiah. And he in this section he's going to he's going to turn his attention to the Philippians and he he's going to address them. He's going to be like, "Guys, let the mature think this way." He says in in 3:15. He, he then in 17 he says, "And imitate me in the way that I consider my life as an imitation of Messiah. And he tells them, man, do not set your minds on earthly things, the, the glory and, and, and the status in worldly eyes that the Judaizers um, 
are fixated on. No, do not set your minds on earthly things, for your citizenship is in heaven. And when um, Christ will come on the day of the Lord, um, at his second coming, that is when you will receive glorified bodies like Christ's glorified body. Look at this. Your citizenship is in heaven. Don't set your mind on earthly things. At Jesus' second coming, he will give us a glorious body. And this word glory, uh, doxa, is so important for this idea of exaltation. Now let's briefly look, um, take a, a quick word then at, uh, at chapter four. We've already looked at several different elements within this chapter, but notice now that in light of all of this theology of the union with Christ, Paul can address these, these two individuals, Judea and, Sy- and Syndicate, and he could say, man, you guys agree, but look at this, agree in Messiah. Um, let his humility be your humility and reconcile with one another. And then um, back to Paul in 4.10 to 20, um, in light of the Philippians' Uh, koinonia with him um, in, in, in the giving. Um, Paul can say, you know what? I have learned contentment. But look at this. He says, man, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be brought low and to abound. I know what it's like to be in hunger and to have plenty, to be in need and to have abundance. For I can do all things in Messiah who strengthens me. Isn't this, this verse just popping so much more that we, we know what Paul is doing with the entirety of this letter? Well, Paul says, I can do all things in Messiah, and so can the Philippians, because they um, also have koinonia with Paul in the sufferings of Messiah, in, in his humility. And they will share with Christ in his exaltation on the day of the Lord when they will receive their resurrection bodies. And that is why the book of Philippians can rightly be called the epistle of joy. 